I want to talk this morning about intelligent effort. Effort has to be intelligent in this work. Can you see the difference between intelligent effort and unintelligent effort? Let's take a simple task. About 25 years ago, we're moving something in this house, and it was very heavy. I was working with this elderly gentleman. The guy was probably about my age now. And I bent over and just, I was going to pick this thing up. And it was heavy. And he said, wait, 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 wait a minute. And he got this big, long pole and made a lever and a fulcrum and, and, you know, and he lifted it up that way. And because he was older, he wanted to spare his back. Because I was younger, I didn't even think about sparing my back. I just thought about getting this job done. The bottom line was there was a difference there. And the difference was between intelligent effort and ordinary effort. My effort was ordinary. It was unintelligent. It was just using my back. He had more flexibility because he had hurt his back. And that made him aware that his back wouldn't take the abuse that mine would take and that mine could get hurt too. So instead, he developed this other plan. And the other plan, as I said, was much more intelligent. We see that effort can be intelligent or ordinary. Intelligent effort is backed by aim. Intelligent effort must be understood. See, he understood the problems of the situation. He understood the problems of the human body in the back. He understood that there was a way to do it without causing himself or me harm physically. And also, it has to be, intelligent effort has to be consensual. You've got to give your consent to it. It wasn't enough for him to come up with this good idea for this intelligent effort. I had to consent to it. I had to agree to it and work with him. Then it became intelligent effort. Had I just done it without agreeing, well, all right, fine, but it's stupid and blah, 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 we could have gotten it done. But you see, I would not have gotten as much out of it. What did I get out of it? Well, obviously, I got a lot more out of it than just moving this heavy object from here to there. Obviously, 25 years later, it's an example now of intelligent effort. And I understand something about it that I didn't understand then. All real effort is about developing the undeveloped sides of ourselves. In order to develop the undeveloped sides of ourselves, we have to use intelligent effort. We can't use ordinary effort. Ordinary effort is like firing bullets in every direction. Joshua m mentioned this film the other day, Ultraviolet. So I got this film and I watched it on Blu-ray. And, and there's one scene in there where she just kind of, she has this automatic weapon and she just spins around and fires bullets in every direction, 360 degrees. And there's this big, you know, the, all these special effects of things going, you know, in this 360 degree circle. And I thought about that. I thought, you know, that's unintelligent effort. It's just kind of a spray. And yeah, maybe you hit something and maybe you don't. An intelligent effort would be to aim at something and squeeze the trigger and hit that something that you aimed at rather than just fire off a burst randomly and wave the gun around in that direction, hoping that something would hit. You see the difference. In order to develop the undeveloped sides of ourselves, we have to take aim. We have to know what the undeveloped sides of ourselves are. And then we have to take aim at them. And it can't be just any old aim. It has to be intelligent aim. If it's beyond the distance that an arrow can fly from a bow to it, then we need something else. If it's beyond the distance that we can hit it with a stone with a slingshot, then we need the arrow and the bow. And if it's beyond the arrow and the bow, then we need the, right, the, the gun. And if it's beyond that gun, then we need a longer rifle, you know, a longer and a different kind of caliber bullet with more power. You know, so we've got all these different variables, and it takes intelligence to be able to hit the mark. Most folks think that effort is doing something you don't want to do. I talked to the kids this morning. Well, how's work? Uh, it's, it's good. I like, really like coming home on the weekends because that's fun. How's it going with you? Well, it's, you know, it's school, and that's really not that much fun. I mean, it can be fun, but usually it's not. We see that effort is associated with, generally with something that we think we have to do. But that's not intelligent effort, is it? That's really not an intelligent approach. It's a young approach. 
but it's not an intelligent approach because it's not understanding. And we need to understand in order to make intelligent effort. Remember, intelligent effort has to be backed by aim, it has to be understood, and it has to be consensual. Those three things are characteristics of intelligent effort. <coughs> Understanding, consent, what was the other one? Aim. And aim. Having a goal, knowing what it is you're going after. A sort of unpleasant, blind obedience. Why do you go to school? Well, I have to. Why do you go to work? Well, I have to. Why do you make this effort? I have to. Unpleasant, blind obedience. I have to. No understanding involved in that, no intelligence involved in that, no flexibility in involved in that. It can be fun, but then usually you're getting in trouble because it's not unpleasant enough. If it's fun, it's not unpleasant. And if it's not unpleasant, it must not be effort. And if it's not effort, well, then you're in trouble because you have to make this effort. That's what I'm talking about, our ordinary idea of effort. Or some people think that effort consists in not doing something. Could you give me an example of not doing something? Whenever I want to just say something, but that whatever I would say could could do damage to a person, and it's an effort to not say something, yes, to keep my right. mouth shut. That's right. That's right. That's an intelligent effort, because you have an aim, and because you're consenting to it. It's not like somebody's making you keep your mouth shut. Nobody's put a gag on you. So it's your own aim, it's your own consent, and it's intelligent because you understand what it is you're doing, and there you have it. What else? Can you give me another example? Can someone give me another example? Diana? Yeah, when people are having a good time and they're gossiping and talking about people and I want to enter in, false personality wants to be a part of that, I've got something to say and join in and I refrain from that because... Right, that's good. Everybody's at the office and there's a big office party and they're all gossiping about somebody who's not there. And you'd love to just jump right in there and be negative and, and slander the person and talk badly about them and make yourself feel good and make yourself feel like you're part of the group and, yeah, nobody really likes her and blah, 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 blah. And then you're one of the good guys and that her person is the bad guy and you're safe for a little while because at least as long as you're all talking about that person, they're not talking about you. Now, there's, you see, everybody's kind of smiling. It's like, oh, well, that wasn't exactly what I meant. No, but that's what I meant. I'd like to take it to the next level. She refrains. Making effort is not doing something, and it's the same thing as Steve, Steve's example of not talking. What about not eating, not smoking, not drinking, not running around with wild women? <laughs> What about that? Yeah. <laughs> 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 off a prison medal. That's not fun. Okay. It's good to know where they stand. <laughs> not lying, not stealing, not eating, not running around with wild women, whatever. So some people think effort consists in not doing something. To have meaning, you've got to understand the effort that you make or else it won't lead anywhere. The more understanding you can have for any effort that you make, then the more meaning that it can have for you. And so Diana's example of, well, when they, everybody's gossiping, but I, I refrain. Okay, well, why, does you, why do you refrain? Well, because the work says that I'm not supposed to do that. Well, that's, that's nice, but the more understanding you have about that, the more centers you involve in that, the more meaning it has for you, the more it feeds better parts of you, the more it lifts you up, the more it expands your consciousness, the more it wakes you up. Can you see that? That my taking it to the next level of, well, that's right, because then they won't be talking about you. And so we see that we've got really a lot of layers of negativity about gossip. And it's not just about not gossiping about this person. We gossip about somebody to protect ourselves. We have it all rationalized and justified so that we're doing it to save ourselves. So to understand all of that helps to expand our consciousness, helps to expand our awareness. The more that we can see about it, the more meaning that we can get from it. The more meaning that we can get from it, the further it will lead us, the better places it will take us to. Effort without understanding can be good experience, but done from understanding of what's needed is much better. So let's say that we have Jess, who has a center of gravity in the moving center. So Jess thinks that the best thing to do is, well, let's just get out there and do that. And he just goes right to work on it. He gets the shovel and he digs, 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 digs. 
But someone else, their center of gravity is in their intellectual center. And they say, well, wait, 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 wait a second, wait a second. Is this where we want the hole? <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, would it be better to soak the ground first, you know, and, and just sit for a little while and, and think about this and just let, let the ground soak a little bit and then be easier to dig. And but Jess is already out there. No, no, no. This is the way. Just hard work is the way. Hard work is the way to do it. And it doesn't matter how hard it is. It's t It's good for you. It makes you strong. And, uh, and, okay. And the other one is like, yeah, but, but really working intelligently is. So anyway, you've got that. And then, of course, you've got somebody who's in the emotional center and they, they, I don't know what they do. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what they do about it. Whatever they do about it. See, <laughs> is it going to be a round hole or a square hole? Because a round hole is, you know, a round hole is so much more. It's yeah. It's softer. It's you know. It's it's rounder. It's 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 nicer. You know it. Yeah, it's it's not a square hole is so angular, you know, and not only that, but it's tough to make the corners that way. And it's a round hole is easier and better. So maybe an emotional person looks at it that way. I don't know. Effort without understanding can be a good experience, but done from understanding of what's needed, it's better. Ask yourself often, what am I really doing, and for what reason? If you ask yourself anything intelligently, it's going to be better for you. Because you have to wake up a little bit to ask yourself questions. What am I really doing and for what reason? Mm -hmm. Can you see how valuable this could be in every aspect of your life? Before you open your mouth and make a real duke of an idea public, what if you asked yourself, what am I really doing and for what reason? How many times would your mouth then stay closed? A lot more often. Yes, a lot more often. We make a great deal of effort to avoid effort. This is another thing about us. We'll make a huge amount of effort to avoid effort. It's a lot like driving 10 miles or 20 miles to get to a sale to save $3 on something when you spent $6 on gas to get there and back. But you save $3 and that is the whole thing. And people do that regularly. So we make a great deal of effort to avoid effort. It's easier, but it's not intelligent because it's not based on understanding our own situation. And really, understanding, unless we understand our own situation, it's not understanding at all, is it? You've got to understand your situation. For you to apply what I say to Jess to yourself may be valuable, but it may not be valuable if your situation is not the same or very similar. Unless you're both, your center of gravity is in both of you is the moving center, then what I have to say to Jess about the moving center is not applicable to you in the same way. We have to understand our situation. If we can understand our own situation, the effort then can be more intelligent. To know what right effort means, you've got to observe yourself objectively and sincerely. And this is why there's so little intelligent effort made, because we want to make the effort without having to observe ourselves objectively and sincerely. We don't mind observing ourselves. As long as we don't have to do, do it objectively, as long as we can be identified with ourselves while we're observing ourselves. Well, I'm really negative. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Ah! Then we like that. Oh, that's we love that kind of self-observation because all that is is just giving full vent to our negativity. We're, I know I'm negative and I know I'm negative and I'm just going to be negative, but I'm going to observe it. And it's a lie. It's just an excuse to be weak. It's an excuse to be negative. It's an excuse to make yourself right. It's an excuse to take the easiest way out. It's what it is. And we need to see it for what it is. And if you do that, then see that you do that. If that's one of your tendencies, then see that you do that. Genuinely, sincerely look at that and say, yes, I do that. Another reason that I uh, say to you, eat what you don't like first. It helps you with your situation. Well, how do you know what you don't like? Well, I've observed that. I don't like that. I didn't used to like Brussels sprouts. Now I really enjoy Brussels sprouts. I don't know what happened. One day I was just, because I always eat what I don't like. I was eating Brussels sprouts and thinking, well, I'm eating Brussels sprouts because I don't like them. And somehow I got it into my head that, why don't, why don't I like them? I'm eating them. I could like them if I wanted to. So I decided, well, I'm eating them. I, I must like them. And ever since then, I've liked Brussels sprouts. I did that with all kinds of vegetables. I could probably even do it with succotash. In fact, I already have. I just, I just don't call it succotash. Call it 
mixed vegetables now. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the, that was it. That was the trick. But when I was a kid, succotash was mush. You know, it, was, it came in of a, I don't know, it was like frozen and they cooked it. Or it, was, well, it was awful. Or it came in a can and it was just awful. It was overcooked when you got it. And then they heated it up and cooked it too much and it was just awful. You couldn't, every, nothing tasted like anything. Nothing crunched. Everything would just want to squish in your mouth. It was just awful. You know, after moving to Southern California and finding out the way you're supposed to eat food, <laughs> you know, I, I got away from the Midwest and the East Coast and found out the way you're supposed to eat food, that actually food can taste good. It doesn't have to all taste the same. You know, it was like, when we remember when we went to England, and uh, I, the English can eat some really strange things. I mean, outside of fish and chips. Fish and chips, of course, is probably the, if there's a culinary contribution that England makes to the planet. It's it's good fish and chips. The problem is you can hardly find good fish and chips outside of England. So it's a good reason to go right there. And I don't eat fish anymore, so I'm stuck with that. But I think if I went to England, I, I think I'd probably have to. Could I be that flexible? Is it even possible to be that flexible? Yeah, I could do it. I could do it. Actually, it's amazing what I can do. It's amazing what any of us can do. When we understand our situation, we have an aim, we can work intelligently, which means we're flexible doesn't it? So if you understand your situation, if you can sincerely see your situation, if you can consent to where you are, what your aim is, and what it will take to make it there, then you have fulfilled all the qualifications for intelligent effort. You can make intelligent effort, and that'll be a real effort, and it will really bring you closer to your goal. Our first aim in the work is to become man number four, balanced man. We're one-sided in life. This is why no one understands anyone else. Because when we're one-sided, we see everything one way. We've got to get to the place where we can be more flexible. And the only way to do that is to intelligently observe ourselves without being identified with what it is that we're observing and sincerely observe it. In other words, be willing to see anything. That's really what sincerely, genuinely observing means. It means be willing to see anything. Be willing to see something that you would normally call very unpleasant or bad and wrong. Be willing to see that. If you're not willing to see that, there's no way that you can observe yourself. Can you see that? We're not to work for results. And right effort will give you more results than unintelligent effort. And I'm not going to say any more about that. You're going to have to work that out yourself. If you're an overeater, it doesn't do a lot of good to quit smoking. It can be useful, but eventually we have to work more intelligently. If you're a smoker, it doesn't help so much to give up caffeine. If you're a drinker, it doesn't help so much to give up eating sugar. If you want to address the problem of overeating, or the problem of smoking, or the problem of doing caffeine if you don't want to be doing caffeine, or the problem of drinking if you don't want to be drinking, if that is your aim, then you need to work intelligently and make effort that will work on that aim. Doesn't mean that quitting something else won't help, but it's not as intelligent, unless it is. And when is it? When you're working up to something, and that's part of your aim. When this is a step toward, when you understand your actual situation, and you know that there's no way that you can quit smoking, but you can quit this, and that will strengthen your will and resolve to be able to take the next step to quit the thing that you can't quit without taking this step to it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Gurdjieff said, well, actually he taught, we've got to break our laziness physically, go beyond what we'd normally avoid in a physical effort. Remember, you used to work with a guy when you were roofing, and he didn't want to go to work because his back hurt. I perceived that it was not real, that it was real for him, but that it was psychosomatic that there was nothing really wrong with his back, there was something wrong in his mind, and that what he had done in his life, the kind of person that he was, the kind of chief feature that he had, was that he would get sick so that he didn't have to do things. That was his out. And so I recommended that he go and do it anyway. And he reluctantly did that and miraculously overcame his back problem. Rex was just talking the other night about a meeting that he was 
going to go to, that he had to go to, that he didn't really want to go to. And all of these physical symptoms, he started to feel sick and tired and feverish and he was coughing. He didn't, he just felt awful and he was just dragging around and he had to go to this meeting and he didn't want to go to the meeting and he had all these excuses now not to go, but he forced himself to go and he said, it's amazing. Once he got in the meeting, they all went away. Every single symptom was gone instantaneously. And again, that is understanding our situation, but it's also, as Gurdjieff taught, breaking our laziness physically, go beyond what we'd normally avoid in physical effort. So what this one person that worked with Jest would have normally avoided in physical effort, he pushed through. What Rex would have normally avoided in physical effort, he pushed through. And upon pushing through, he found that it was just a smokescreen. It was just the mind's way, the false personality's way of stopping us from doing something that we set out to do. Gurdjieff said, in all physical work, all centers should be employed, and then it becomes intelligent and useful. And this is the problem. We get involved in physical work, and if you're in the moving center, the physical work is all that you're interested in. But you have to employ the other centers. You have to employ the in intellectual center and the emotional center with the instinctive moving center in order for it to be really intelligent and useful. That's what he taught. Mechanical effort is distinct from conscious effort. Notice what you're doing. Notice your resistance to it. Try to give it your consent through understanding whatever it is you're doing. If you've got something to do in a work sense, try to give it your consent. Don't do it just because the work says you have to do it. You should do it. Don't do it just because I gave you a task. Try to give it your consent. Try not to be blindly obedient. That will not give you as much. You, there is some value in that, but it will not give you as much as if you bring your awareness to it. I remember we went through this thing with Steve when I said, well, are you going to another 10-day? And he said, well, no, I don't, I don't really want to do that. Do you think I should? And I said, well, I think it's an opportunity, and I think you could get value from it. He said, well, I'll go if you tell me to go, but, I, I bet I'm, but otherwise I'm not going to go. It's like, well, I'm not going to tell you to go because that's not... that's. I will not require that kind of effort from you. In other words, if you can't make an intelligent effort, I will not require you to make an unintelligent effort. I will not require you to do that. So either you come up to making an intelligent effort or you make, or we go, or we don't do anything at all. So we didn't do anything at all. That is what we're talking about. You've got to step up to the next level. You've got to make the effort to reach higher. You've got to make the effort to get beyond where you are now. In order to do that, you've got to do it intelligently. You can't do it in the way you've always done it. You can't listen to me and say, oh, well, he said to do it, so therefore I'm going to do it. That's not good enough anymore. Now you have to go beyond that. Now more is required of you. And what requires more of you? Where you are. Where you are requires more for you to get to the next place. Gurdjieff said, a man should try to master what he's doing physically. Notice what he's doing and how he's doing it and how to do it more easily, faster, and more intelligently. This is one of my favorite things to do. I like when I'm doing a task physically. I like to find how to do it faster, how to do it more intelligently, how to do it more efficiently. I enjoy that. It employs a lot of centers. And the more centers are employed, the more alive I am, the more awake I am. The more awake I am, the more I am with the task. People would find, like, I remember folding newsletters. I used to sit down and fold newsletters, and people would get so perplexed. They would say, why are you doing this grunt work? Why are you doing this mindless labor? Well, because it's not mindless labor. I bring my mind to it. I can fold newsletters straighter and faster and more efficiently and better than most people who just fold newsletters. Why? Because I brought more to it. I made it a real joy because I was there and I was bringing as many centers and as much consciousness to bear on each newsletter as I could bring. Where other people were just talking about something else, they'd sit around and it was like a hen session where they'd all sit around and talk, oh, ho, ho, and they'd fold newsletters and they'd come out all crooked and this way and that way and inside out and backwards. And, Mine were not. They were nicely stacked, and I wasn't in the hen talk so much, but I was there to fold newsletters. And when I folded newsletters, I folded newsletters with as many centers as I could muster and as much awareness as I could muster, and I loved it because it was something that I could do. The same is true for you. When you're doing physical labor, bring as much to it as you can. 
Bring as many centers to it as you can. Work as intelligently as you know how to work. Bring as much emotion and desire for excellence and quality to it as you can. And do it as efficiently as possible. That takes the intellectual center, the moving center, and the emotional center. You're employing three centers, you're going to get a lot more out of it. You get more meaning from it. Mechanical goodness is lost to you, but conscious goodness gives you force. Well, what does that mean? It means if you're folding newsletters and you're doing it, and you're saying that each person who reads this, you know, I am, I am sending this to each person who's going to read this. I'm folding this for each person who's going to open it. You bring that kind of consciousness to something. Can you see the difference? Do you think that that could have any effect on you? Great. That's what I'm talking about. We aim at using parts of centers we don't use ordinarily. Opening up our three-story house that we live in. And actually, the part of our three-story th three house that we live in is usually a very small part, isn't it? It's usually the basement or maybe the kitchen for some of us. Some of us live in the bathroom. But everybody has this little part of their little three of their three-story house that they live in. What we're trying to do is open this up so that we can move freely through the entire house, so that the whole house is ours, so that we can use freely all of the centers, so that we can work in harmony and together, so that we can become balanced man, so that we can become intelligent and do things in a flexible, efficient, productive way. Now, is it just about doing things? No. It's about becoming balanced man. It's our first goal in this work. We have the possibility of transforming each moment approaching life differently. Folding newsletters. You have the possibility of transforming folding newsletters to a boring task to something that really has meaning because you give it meaning, because you employ your centers and give it meaning where ordinarily people would not because it's not worth their time. But it is worth your time if this is what you're doing. And this is what we need to remember. You can't remember this unless you remember your aim. One way is to keep silence. This work is a discipline in every direction for every center. Another way is don't show too much that you're working. You know, some people, it's so obvious that they're working. It's like they remind me sometimes of the scribes and the Pharisees who stand on the street corners and make, you know, and, and with their long this and that, you know, their long sleeves and their phylacteries on and, and they're looking very pious. So if someone's fasting, and he, you know, he has a long face and he looks so like he's suffering. Oh, it's, I haven't had anything to eat in days. And, and then, you know, or, or, or people who go and they pray and other people watch them and go, oh, he's so holy and pious. You know, then everything, that you got what you wanted. You wanted people to see that? That's what you got. It all fell on false personality. Nothing. There's nothing left for your essence. There's nothing left to, left to feed your essence. All the, the husks of that go right to the pig, go right to the swine, go right to false personality, which gobbles it up and asks for more. So don't show too much that you're working. Through self-observation, discern where you avoid certain kinds of effort. This is another good area of work. Look and see where you avoid certain kinds of effort. What kinds of effort do you avoid? Just that simple. Look at yourself and see what kinds of effort you avoid. Where do you always get negative? You know, what is the one thing that can always make you negative? At what point do you always identify? What's the one thing you can be counted on to get identified about? All right, I'll give you a good example. I came out this morning to get in my car, and it's got a designer paint job now. Now, black cars don't do well. Have you ever noticed that they look great when they're clean, but it doesn't take long and it doesn't take much, and then they start to look not so great. So I come out, it's got this designer paint job. The whole boot of the car, the whole trunk of the car is covered with cat prints. There's cat prints on the windshield. There's The cat was everywhere. I didn't know a cat could walk on the side of a car. <laughs> Down the back of the car, the top of the car, inside the car, all over the dashboard, they're kitty prints, cat prints everywhere. I instantly got identified. What is it always makes you identified? What can you be counted on to get identified about? You know, I can be counted on to get identified about if I just watch the car and somebody goes and does something. I can be counted on to identify with that. Count on me. We need to see these things about ourselves. Now, it's not pleasant to see that, but there it is. When do things become intolerable for you? At what point does it become intolerable? Okay, that's enough. Now, at what point do the kids whispering become, and, and messing around in the back, become intolerable? 
At what point do you have to turn around and point? At what point do you have to stand up and puff yourself up? Now, I know you all know who that is, so just don't smile. At what point does it become intolerable for you? This is what you need to see about yourself. And finally, yes, finally, shut up, will you? <laughs> I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to shut up. <laughs> what do you feel is your right? See, these are all good questions that we need to ask ourselves. And the more regularly we ask ourselves these things, the better off we'll be and the more we'll be able to work. What do you feel is your right? Okay, I'm done with that part. Now we can move on to something a little more pleasant. Well, okay, I lied. What is owed to you before you can consent to do anything? Before you can be an example, before you can consent to be, be used as an example, what's owed to you? Well, don't touch me, don't restrain me, don't make me look bad, don't... Look at the list of things that you've got before you can give your consent. It's sad, really, when you think about it. This will show us we are very limited people, capable of very little goodwill and very little effort. And be sure that Cheap Features has its hand in all of this. Understand, only extra effort counts. Doesn't count to meditate for an hour and 10 minutes. That doesn't count. What counts is the 10 minutes after the hour and 10 minutes. That's what counts. Why? Because that is the effort that you really made. Or perhaps, perhaps your effort started to count after the first half hour. I don't know that. Only you know that. But you know the point. And after that point, effort starts to count. It doesn't mean you should be sweating bullets and tormenting yourself, just in case you were going there. I can see that some of you were. To remain in our usual sphere of ourselves takes no effort, no extra effort for sure, which gives us no chance of becoming man number four, balanced man. A man whose center of gravity is in his moving center won't think he needs to make intellectual effort and really think. He'll work longer in the moving center and call that extra effort. So be aware of that. Intelligent effort must be connected to extra effort. It's not going to be extra effort unless it's intelligent. You've got to connect those two. It can't be just mindless, mechanical, extra effort. That won't work. Finally, balanced man has all the centers contributing their different meanings to daily life. This is what you're looking for. You're looking for a more full experience of life. And how you get that is by having all of the centers contributing their meaning to your experience of life. Can you see how much more full that would be? It's like folding the newsletters. What is the difference between being conscious and being unconscious? The more centers you have involved, the more there, the more present you are, the more aware you are, the more involved you are with it, the more conscious you are. The less involved you are, the more mindless you are about it, the more you're doing something else, some flight of fancy in your head or this or that or talking or chatting or talking on the phone or doing something else other than what it is you, you, the task set before you, then the less conscious. Does that make any sense? If you want to reach man number four, you're going to have to employ more centers. And the only way to do that is to make intelligent effort. Understand your situation, observe yourself sincerely, and then make the effort where that understanding and that observation and also consent to it, do it willingly. Make the effort where that understanding and observation dictates that it will be most beneficial for you. You'll get there. <laughs>